<laughs> Once again, we're feeling Hallelujah, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen. Oh, <laughs> Hugging that peace time. So happy Easter to you all. Until Pentecost, June 3rd this year for us, June 4th actually. We will be shouting out the salutation Michael, so we would better get used to it. Isn't that wonderful? It is most appropriate that the most important event of the Christian year is celebrated for 50 days. Now, are we about finished with all our chocolate eggs, jelly beans, and peeps by now? Are we still dishing out boiled eggs in the mornings or in salads or sandwiches at lunchtime? So delicious. I still actually have a few jelly beans left. Again, only sidebars to what really is important about this season, Easter. So after the, all the joyous singing, last Saturday night and Sunday morning, what do we find today in the Gospel reading? We get to take a peek at what the disciples are doing, and they are not shouting out hallelujahs, are they? The setting is still that first Easter day in John. Mary Magdalene has already shared the fantastic news about seeing the Lord and the words that the risen Jesus had spoken to her. The mood here is quite different, however. It was evening on that day, the first day of the week. We are approaching the darkness again. And the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked. Another kind of darkness, a foreboding of a closed nature. Why were they locked? John says it is because the disciples were experiencing a fear of the Jews. Wait a minute. These Jewish lads were afraid of other Jews. Take this business with a grain of salt, my friends. This was an accusation of John's community towards the Jewish community who told them to move on with their new ideas about Jesus outside the synagogue. The disciples' movement into this new way of following Jesus had not quite started yet. The disciples, more accurately, should have been afraid of the Roman authorities. Anyway, they are really in a bad way. Then Jesus appears to them and offers peace. And after showing his hands and feet to them, it wasn't just to Thomas the next time, but he showed it to them as well, they immediately rejoice when they recognize Jesus. No one seems to question how Jesus got through the locked doors, but that does not matter. Their beloved Lord is with them again, away from the trial, the crucifixion, and the tomb. Jesus breathes on them, giving them the presence of the Holy Spirit to take away their fear and to bolster them up in this new experience. Then Jesus gives them further direction. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. With love, let go of any infractions that are given to you because keeping hold of these will only poison you. Next, we are given that wonderful story of Thomas. What would we do without him? I know I have told you before that my home parish was St. Thomas's, so I have a special place in my heart for him. He gets labeled with the nickname Doubter or Doubting Thomas. History can be rather cruel cool at times. This disciple loved Jesus. Thomas was a follower and believed in the teachings of Jesus. But he was also in a state of shock and grief with the death of Jesus. He also was not present when Jesus first appeared to his fellow disciples in that locked house. How that must have hurt, because you know when he returned to the house after Jesus first left, that is all we heard about from the guys. Of course there would have been questions about the accuracy of what they were talking about to him. Thomas felt left out of this amazing event. How natural for him to question them 
and not totally believe what they had seen. He was hurt and bothered he had missed out. So he very humanly responded with a challenge to see and feel the wounds of Jesus should Jesus reappear. And reappear, Jesus did. It took a week, but the disciples were all gathered at that house again. The doors were shut, but we don't know if they were locked this time. Had the disciples eased up on their fear due to the presence of Jesus and to have had the Holy Spirit breathe on them? Jesus stands among them and offers peace again. And suddenly, Jesus sends his Thomas among them and offers the chance for Thomas to see and feel the wounds as he had claimed he needed in order to believe. And Jesus says, do not doubt, but believe. Thomas does not need to do either. He doesn't say, oh, then he touched the wounds and then he looked at them. He feels the presence of Jesus with him, and he utters that wonderful phrase, my Lord and my God. It is an immediate reaction on Thomas's part, just as it was an immediate reaction from the disciples the week before when they heard Jesus offer them peace. Thomas would never doubt again after this experience. Tradition has it that he went on to India to spread the good news and start many churches. And tradition also has it that he was killed by a lance as a martyr. It is almost as if Jesus were looking at us in the 21st century when he says, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. We can believe in the good news without ever having been in that first century. The cloud of witnesses has provided us with so many examples of stories, situations in which people have experienced the presence of Jesus. We are the beneficiaries of all of them as we sit here this morning at St. Stephen's in West Valley City, Utah. We also have those experiences within our hearts of the presence of Jesus. Our faith, our belief is genuine, is real, is palpable. And we find ourselves often repeating the words of Thomas, my Lord and my God. Then John makes that remarkable comment. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Can you imagine if we had them? What kind of stories would we have heard? What kind of reactions from the disciples would have been revealed? How many times did Jesus have to get their attention with offering peace? What we have, however, are the signs that have captured our attention and have allowed us to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing we may have life in his name. That is inspiring. That is awesome. That is something that will help us navigate this life of ours, isn't it? We do have life in Christ's name. We are the body of Christ and serve God by being the hands and heart of Christ. A joyous responsibility, would you say, by sharing kindness, acceptance, and love through our understanding of what we have during the season of Easter. We continue to celebrate and be blessed by the very nature of having Christ in our hearts. This is amazing. Let us pray. From Stephen Shakespeare. Alpha and Omega our beginning and our end. You break through the locks of gated communities and hardened hearts. Accept our doubts. Heal our desire for certainty. And by your Spirit's gentle touch, make us a people forgiven and forgiving. Through Jesus Christ, the giver of peace. Amen. Amen.